the online Unitarian Universalist Dictionary of Biography has an anecdote that serves as example and metaphor for the neglect of important black women in our history and of Frances Harper in particular. Some Unitarians went to her gravesite to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the publication in 1892 of Eola Leroy, her fourth and best known novel, said to be an homage to the work of Ida B. Wells. They intended to give her a tombstone, but then they found buried in the nearly 70 years since her death that one was already there. It bore a stanza from her poem, Bury Me in a Free Land. I ask no monument, proud and high, to arrest the gaze of passers-by. All that my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slaves. I speak from Vermont, home of the Abenaki branch of the Iroquois. Vermont banned slavery, even as it formed into an independent republic in 1777. But it's not so easy in rural Vermont to purchase books, especially if you don't use Amazon. But with help from village librarian, Tony Eubanks, I was able to procure Francis E.W. Harper, published this year in the UK, written by Oots McKnight, chair of the Department of Gender and Race Studies and professor of political science at the University of Alabama. Two earlier works that McKnight commends are Discarded Legacy and A Brighter Coming Day. I've relied on Knight's fine analysis of Harper's literary body of work, which was at least 20 volumes of poetry, four novels, the first short story ever published by an African-American woman, innumerable essays and articles. He gives due significance to her success as a public speaker at a time when women were not allowed academic roles from which to serve as public intellectuals. Indeed, when they were not even supposed to speak publicly, especially black women. He stresses her instinct for intersectionality. That is portraying and holding to common political and human interests in order to bring forth a just and democratic community. He would have us understand that she knew what we must do and that we could never be whole until we did. She lived when there was a window of opportunity for us to do the right thing, like now. She had an American rescue plan. McKnight writes, this is still the America of Frances Harper. To pretend otherwise is to have decided that black women, that black people and that women don't matter to our past or future. But this would mean we weren't a democracy, except in name. Frances Harper was born of free blacks in Baltimore in 1825. We know nothing else about her parents except that both had died by the time she was three and we don't know why. We know she grew up in the Baltimore home of an aunt and uncle named Watkins free Blacks also, who had long been active in the anti-slavery movement. William Watkins had begun an academy for Negro youth in 1820. So she received an education as well as a home and a name to use, even if it was not her patronymic. At 13 or so, she began to work for a kindly white family, possibly Quaker, who had either a good private library or a bookstore, references say both. They let her read. And when they saw how she liked poetry, they encouraged her to write poems herself. She had a poem published in the newspaper when she was 14. By the time she was 20, she had her first collection published. And then she would become the most popular black poet in the country. Her poetry readings would draw large audiences that included literate abolitionist whites, probably some Unitarians, Things began to change in 1850. And, and from now on, I'll just point out some very crucial years in, in her younger life. In 1850, the Fugitive Slave Law was passed. You may know that it let white slavers in Maryland, still a slave state, pick up suspected escaped slaves. 
but it led to free blacks being picked up indiscriminately. The Watkins family decided Baltimore was too dangerous for them to stay there. Well, Frances had to leave also. Due to her education and seamstress skills, she was able to procure a job teaching sewing at the African Methodist and Episcopal Union Seminary in Ohio. She was the first woman ever hired to teach there. But after one year, and who, who knows what the sole female faculty member would experience even in a seminary, she moved on to a job in Pennsylvania teaching young children. She loved this, but it didn't allow her much time or energy for activism. In 1853, she moved for the first time to Philadelphia to dwell with the family of black abolitionist William Still, chair of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society, organizer of the Underground Railroad. Harper's name is on no list of conductors, but it's established that she was involved, knew Harriet Tubman well, and contributed much of her earnings to railroad activities to help slaves escape. Now, I think it might have been Peter Clark, another Black Unitarian, who introduced her to the Quaker William Still, because he was in Ohio when she was there. Also in 1853, she's 28 now, she publishes an essay, Christianity, in which she unequivocally affirms her faith and reliance on Christianity as a pro-social belief system that in itself could bring about racial and gender justice. She gains an even wider readership and, quoting McKnight, it established a religious context for the majority of her writing and political activism to come. In 1854, she sees published poems on miscellaneous subjects, her most popular volume. It will be reprinted five times. It sells 10,000 copies. In the same year, Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass sells 100 copies. Because of her widening audience, she's offered a position as public speaker with the Maine Anti-Slavery Society. And for the next three years, she tours the Eastern States in Canada to promote the abolitionist movement and to strengthen support for the railroad. Sojourner Truth is often beside her on this tour. In 1859, Harper's Ferry, the attack, John Brown's attack occurs. She manages to get a letter of thanks to John Brown in his jail cell. And then she visits Mary Day Brown, his wife, for the two weeks throughout the ordeal of his execution. And afterward, she continues to provide moral support and financial help to Mary Day Brown. In 1860, she becomes Frances Harper when she marries a widower with three children named Fenton Harper. By that time, she was a very successful poet and writer who, although she had always donated much of her earnings to the cause, has enough saved that they can purchase a dairy farm. Imagine that from the sale of poetry. And sometimes she didn't sell her little chapbooks that went along with her poetry readings and lectures, but let people take them freely. Francis and Fenton had one child, Mary, before he died in 1864. During those four years, she didn't travel on lecture tours, have much time for anything but being a farmer's wife. Sadly, he was dead by the time the war ended, as was her married life. When that happened, Frances went south with other dedicated people from the north. To every, she went to every state but Texas and Arkansas, staying in the homes of desperately poor blacks to teach them to read to help them begin to believe in themselves, be there as they began recovering from the trauma of enslavement. Reconstruction was supposedly underway, but she could see the need was immense. She could see the beginnings of the Black Code and Jim Crow long before the federal troops pulled out of the South, marking the official collapse of Reconstruction in 1877. She saw little fulfillment of the promises of reparation. By 1866, when Francis has to travel north uh, from the south, and it was probably dangerous travel even then, to share stage with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony at the 11th convention of the American Equal Rights Association, she's seen enough that she's angry in the behalf of blacks in the south and the freed slaves. 
she will give her best known speech, We Are All Bound Together, in which she talks for the good of all, but beyond the single issue of women's suffrage. This is the first wave feminist split over the issue of the 15th Amendment, which would give black men the vote. She and others, including Lucy Stone and Frederick Douglass, want blacks to have any means possible for protection against the lynchings and other forms of terrorism they've begun to see in the post-war South. Any protection possible against what her character Eola Leroy will call the virus of racism. I hope you will find time on your own to read all of this. I have a link to it in a, a short uh, reference sheet, but just now I'm going to read some of it. We are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity and society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving the curse in its own soul. You tried that in the case of the Negro, you pressed him down for two centuries and in so doing, you crippled the moral strength and paralyzed the spiritual energies of the white men of the country. When the hands of the blacks were fettered, white men were deprived of the liberty of speech and the freedom of the press. Society cannot afford to neglect the enlightenment of any class of its members. At the South, the legislation of the country was in behalf of the rich slaveholders, while the poor white man was neglected. And what's the consequence today? From that very class of neglected poor white men comes the man who stands today with his hand upon the helm of the nation. He fails to catch the watchword of the hour and throws himself the incarnation of meanness across the pathway of the nation. This grand and glorious revolution which has commenced will fail to reach its climax of success until throughout the length and breadth of the American Republic, the nation shall be so colorblind as to know no man by the color of his skin or the curl of his hair. It will then have no privileged class trampling upon and outraging the unprivileged classes, but will be then one great privileged nation whose privilege will be to produce the loftiest manhood and womanhood that humanity can attain. I do not believe that giving the women the ballot is immediately going to cure all the ills of life. I do not believe that white women are dew drops just exhaled from the skies. I think that like men, they may be divided into three classes, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. Talk of giving women the ballot box, go on. It's a normal school and the white women of this country need it. While there exists this brutal element in society, which tramples upon the feeble and treads down the weak, I tell you that if there is any class of people who need to be lifted out of their airy nothings and selfishness, it is the white women of America. Um, maybe I mentioned that she was angry. <laughs> And maybe you can see why this was the first feminist split. The American Equal Rights Association broke up. Sometime later, Harper's group formed the American Women's Suffrage Association. Men could be members and it would operate for state by state advocacy for votes of women. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony formed the National Women's Suffrage Association. There won't be any men in it and they will go for all or nothing on the national level. Later in 1890, they will come back together as the National American Women's Suffrage Association, but harm has been done to the first wave that will infect like a virus, the second wave feminism of the 60s that those of us my age knew. But guess what? Here's, the, here's good news, Harper's focus on intersectionality, in this case, the, supporting the vote for black men, 
her sense that we're all bound together prevailed. New third and fourth wave feminists got that message. A quick search for definition of third and fourth wave feminism will list inter intersectionality as a movement principle. In 2011, so this is 20 years since a small group from the same First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia, which by the way, Francis Harper joined in 1871. 20 years after that small group went looking for her grave, the first church celebrated the 100th anniversary of Harper's passing with a week-long program of events. Their webpage of planned activities began with a member's confession that he'd fallen in love with a woman, not his wife. In a block at the top of the webpage, somebody named Larry Robin, a member says, I am attracted to smart women. I'm attracted to talented women. I am attracted to brave women. I married one and we live happily ever after. Then six months ago, I was introduced to this amazing woman who lived just a few blocks from me. Her name is Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Okay, she died a hundred years ago, but that's not relevant. It's so much fun to fall in love and I love sharing. And now that I know Frances, I want everyone to know her. I hope that we will learn to know, learn more about Frances Harper, that we'll take her into our hearts, learn more about her, love her forever. And um, one of the books you can read is The Brighter Coming, Coming Day. And um, there's a video fire chat of less than three weeks ago from the uh, Library Company of Philadelphia. That's Ben Franklin's first library in America with uh, Derek Spires, a young African-American professor at Cornell speaking about her style and her tremendous authority as a poet. Harper's last afterwards in Eola Leroy, her last major publication are these from a longer poem. Though the morning seems to linger or the hilltops far away, yet the shadows bear the promise of a brighter coming day. Thank you so much.